Madam Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I now recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mulvaney. Uh, you mentioned that the President promised that he would not cut Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. And uh, after uh, he won the uh, election with the help of plenty of older Americans, um, I think we're seeing today a tremendous betrayal of that promise mm -hmm. and of the people who rely on those programs. And I think it's in order to give enormous tax cuts to the wealthiest individuals and corporations. He never did say Social Security retirement. He said Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. And the trust fund, the Social Security trust fund has two major components the OASI, Old Age and Survivor Insurance, and SSDI, the Social Security Disability Insurance. The contributions come from the same payroll tax, they go into the same Social Security Trust Fund, and together make up what we know as the Social Security Program. Yet this budget makes dramatic changes to SSDI that would, among other things, cut the retroactive benefits that a serious disabled construction worker, for example, can receive for the time the Social Security Administration takes to work through its backlog of cases and finally give approval, which can take, rates, uh, can take years. So, Mr. Mulvaney, when I'm asking, yes or no, does the President's budget cut $72 billion from the Social Security Disability Insurance com uh, Program? I don't have the number in front of me, but yes, we do make uh, reforms and reductions within the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. Um, a couple things. I think you, you, you may have... Well, I'm sure you, your you spoke staff could provide you with the number, no, well, and that's really well, what I'm asking. But you said you went, the money goes into the same trust fund as old age. It does not. They are separate trust funds. Uh, so that's important to know because they're on different timelines. Um, this is how I explain uh, Social Security Disability Insurance, Ms. Schakowsky, which is that we also propose a, a parental, paid parental leave program. We are running that, funding that through the unemployment insurance programs in the states, which is, by the way, the same way Canada does it. Um, New York, New Jersey, California, one other state Mr. have... Mr. Mulvaney, have, uh, my time is so limited, and I'm not uh, asking but I'm, but I'm happy about to ask, that particular no, program. I, uh, I'm asking, you asked about SSDI, ma'am, and I'm happy to get to that. The point of the matter is that many states fund their parental leave through disability. We propose through unemployment insurance. Does that mean that having a baby is unemployment? No. Does it mean that having a baby is disability? No, it just happens to be that that is how the program is structured because the infrastructure is there. Social Security Disability is not Social Security. Social Security Disability Insurance is disability insurance. It's a welfare program for the disabled. It, okay, we, we disagree on that. I think most Americans disagree that Social Security Disability Insurance is part of that guaranteed program. Mr. Mulvaney, the President pledged not to cut Medicaid. Now, uh, I, I just want to point out, you've, we've dealt with this a little bit today, but we are talking about half the births in the United States, 30 million children, and half of all nursing home and long-term care nationwide for senior citizens and people with disabilities comes out of Medicaid. So it's really yes or no if the does the President's budget cut $1.3 trillion from Medicaid over 10 years? I'll, I'll ask you a question, Congresswoman. When you say cut, are you speaking Washington or regular language? Will the President's budget mean that Medicaid gets $1.3 trillion less than it would otherwise? In the CBO baseline score, the answer is yes. It will spend more money every single year over the previous year, with the exception I've mentioned. That, in my mind, is an increase in Medicaid spending. Okay. Um, I want to um, quote you, Mr. Mulvaney. You said that um, in regard to after-school programs, they're supposed to be educational programs, right? They're supposed to help kids who don't get fed at home and uh, so they get do better in school. Guess what? There's no demonstrable evidence they actually, they're actually helping result, they're helping results, helping kids do better in school. The way we justified it was these programs are going to help these kids do better in school and we can't prove that that's happening. You, this budget cuts the 21st century learning program, it eliminates it entirely. And this is a program that does before school, 
after school and summer programs that do include food for children. What the heck is going on? Uh, less than 20 percent of the children who enroll in that program actually move from not proficient to proficient. 20 percent is a failing So grade. let's just not feed them. How do we justify? My time is up. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Lewis, for five minutes. I would thank the chair and welcome uh, Director Mulvaney. Glad to have you back in the Budget Committee. Uh, let me start with a couple of quick questions and a, and a short yes or no answer on a couple of these things and then we'll get into a more substantive give and take a little bit. It's interesting to note, especially from the other side, that the first balanced budget in over eight years or in eight years has been greeted by moral outrage. Um, shockingly extreme, so I think is the phrase I heard. Do you find it shockingly extreme that our, our, our debt has gone from $10.6 to $19.9 trillion in just the last eight years? I absolutely do. Do you find it shockingly extreme that we're mired in 1.9% growth over the next 10 years? Frustratingly so, yes, sir. Do you find it shockingly extreme that we've had record tax revenue last year, over $3.2 trillion, and yet we have a $600 billion deficit this year? It's unacceptable. Shockingly extreme that net interest expense is projected to be $768 billion, but if interest rates go back to their post-World War II average 10-year Treasury at 5.7 percent, it'll be well over a trillion dollars. We'll be broke. Uh, so it's shockingly extreme that the federal budget outlays has gone from a trillion dollars in 1987 to two trillion in 2002 to four trillion today. Growing much faster than every other measure of economic output. Is it still shockingly extreme that federal revenue is above its 50-year average of 17.4 percent of GDP? Now it's at 17.8 percent of GDP, and yet we're told it's not enough. Um, it's never enough, is it? Shockingly extreme that federal outlays are above their 50-year average of GDP, 20.3 percent, today at 21 percent, scheduled to go to 23.4 percent of GDP. Just unacceptable. Federal debt held by the public, 77 percent of, of GDP, uh, but actually total federal debt is almost 100 percent of GDP, correct? Is that shockingly extreme? And going to have long-term detrimental economic impact on our economy. And the civilian labor force participation rate back to 1977 levels at 60, uh, what, 62.8 percent? Uh, even lower than it should be given the graying of the American workforce population. And finally, is it shockingly extreme that the top 25 percent of taxpayers, those households making $78,000 a year or more, two teachers making $40,000 a year, actually pay 87 percent of all income taxes collected? Yeah, that's, um, that's where the money is, right? So in spite of all of the debt, all of the spending, all of the Keynesian stimulus, we are stuck at 1.9 percent growth. The CBO says it's going to be 1.9 percent growth for the next 10 years. And I'm wondering why that is, if that's all supposed to be so stimulative and we're going to have the multiplier effect and demand side economics is going to pull us out of this. Isn't the President's budget and what you're defending today uh, a, a, an attempt to, to make certain that we grow at historical averages by not focusing on this, this pumping up or priming of demand, but getting investment and productivity back in the economy? Private investment is what's going to save the company, save the country, because that is where innovation comes from, that's where productivity comes from, and that's where GDP growth comes from. Uh, we've tried it the other way. We've tried it with huge federal spending for the last 30 years. And now here we are where a large portion of the population, a large portion of this body, thinks that 1.9 percent is the best we are going to be, ever be able to do. And that, that, that bespeaks a pessimism about the country that we simply refuse to accept. And we've heard this notion of malaise. We're stuck in slow growth. We just can't move. Jimmy Carter talked about malaise. And yet we had five consecutive quarters after the pro-growth policies in the early 80s of 7 percent growth. Uh, Where is the empirical evidence that we can't grow at 3.5 3, 3 percent? No, I think the empirical evidence is that we can grow at 3 percent. So the, the emphasis of this budget is to say we've got the, the highest corporate tax rate in the developed world at 35 uh, percent. We've got $2.6 trillion in profits that could be repatriated. We've got a pass-through tax rate. Subchapter S, LLC, small business man or woman, paying not 39.6 percent, but 43, 44 percent when you take out the, the P, PEP and P's and the itemized deductions. Okay. Lowering those tax rates is going to provide more capital, which is going to increase productivity. The truck driver, is it not true, Director Mulvaney, is always more productive with the truck. Always. And therefore, that's what this budget is supposed to do. And we've got data to show it's been done in the past, in the 60s, in the 80s, and even in the 90s. Not only that, we need to do it to save the country. 
In fact, without this sort of growth and this investment in productivity, we'll never balance the budget. No, sir. Well, I take that back. At some point, we will balance the budget. The question is, do we do it on our terms or on someone else's? Because at some point, people will start to refuse to lend us money. And I'd much rather do it on our terms than somebody else's. Thank you, Director Mulvaney. Good to see you again, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, since, Mr. Mulvaney, you began the meeting by um, providing a better name for this budget, you described it as the taxpayer first budget. I describe it as the taxpayer shaft budget, because that's really what you're doing to millions and millions of people who simply are trying to make sure that they can keep their head above water and live a decent lifestyle. And I find irony in your lamenting the, that, we, that there's some kind of double counting in the total cost of the cuts in Trump care. Because let's be clear, <laughs> this budget, as you described, does not balance. Hubris doesn't solve basic math problems. The Trump budget counts the savings from tax cuts and projects that these same tax cuts will stimulate growth in the economy and generate so much new revenue that it will produce $2.1 trillion in additional federal revenue. Now, you can't balance the budget by ignoring the reduction in revenue from tax cuts and then count the cuts as generating unprecedented, never-before-realized growth attributable to those tax cuts, and then trying to use that growth in revenue as a pay-for for the tax cuts. <laughs> That's, that is what's called double counting. So let me give a real, a real life example. If I bought solar panels from my house and I reduced my electric bill through the savings by disconnecting from the grid, but then I didn't count the cost of the solar panels in my household budget and just ignored that there was a significant cost, and then I tried to also count the savings in my electric bill as an offset to the cost of the actual solar panels, then that would be double counting, particularly if I say that the offset is more than the cost of the solar panels. I, if I went to my accountant and said, my household budget using this configuration is balanced, he would laugh at me. Your Treasury Secretary, when confronted with the double counting, said that it was premature to put in any changes as a result of taxes since you're not far along enough far enough along to, uh, to estimate what the impact would be. So, I mean, look, we, we can all go through this exercise, and that's certainly what we're doing. Um, we can pretend that we're actually going to come up with a budget that, uh, that we can all agree on and, and send to the president when we haven't done that in years. Um, one thing, though, that is absolute certainty is that a budget is an expression of our values, and your values and your boss's values are appalling. Um, if this is a reflection of our nation's values, then we really are uh, in an internecine battle for the heart and soul of this country. So with that in mind, um, and I'd love to have you respond to that, I'll ask both my questions and then leave you the remaining time. 65% um, of seniors who rely on Medicaid to be able to afford a nursing home or nursing care in their homes, do it through Medicaid. How can states continue to implement innovative programs to deliver long-term care to seniors and people with disabilities in their homes when you're taking $610 billion from them? So if you could answer both of those questions. Sure, I can try. I'd love um, to you just illuminate the committee on your math. Yeah, uh, and I'll start, Congresswoman, with, with with the pushback on the never before realized growth. That's what's so depressing, is that people think that 3% growth is never before realized. It used to be an annual thing. And yet now here we are assuming that that's how we, did, that's how we describe below average long-term growth in this Please country. address the double that's counting. Okay. The double okay. counting, that's, that's my question. Yeah, the double counting. Um, Mr. Secretary Mnuchin was right. It, it, it is and was too early to make any assumptions about what the final tax bill looks like. We gave a set of principles to the House, and the House and the Senate are both looking at them right now. So then, so clearly, budget, you representing that this budget is balanced is inaccurate. No, it's not. You can't both say it's premature I'd and say that the, ba the budget balances. I'd be more question if you give me the chance, but I'm absolutely not suggesting that the budget balance is inaccurate. So if I may continue. <laughs> um, we assumed, we had to make assumptions regarding what the tax bill would look like. 
right? There's three assumptions you could make. Either it adds to the deficit, subtracts from the deficit, or is deficit neutral. And we assume, for sake of doing the budget, that it would be deficit neutral, that the exclusion, the removing the exclusions, the deductions, the loopholes would lead us to a tax, excuse me, a deficit neutral tax plan. The dynamic benefit is only counted one time, and that's towards the 3 percent economic growth. And I'm happy to explain that to you further in writing, if you like. You can explain whatever you'd like. You are counting revenue twice and saying the budget is balanced, and anyone running their household the budget that gentle way time would be expired. in serious financial trouble down the road, as you are heading us the towards. The gentlelady's time I has expired. Back.